No, he didn't. Everybody's set. Yeah. Everybody's set. We're ready to begin. Um, you ready? Good afternoon. I'm Attorney Ben Crump, along with Attorney Ray Hamlin. Attorney Nabiha Shear, Attorney Desiree Austin. We have the honor of representing the daughters of Malcolm X. Present with us is Ilyasha Sebaz and Camila Sebaz. The purpose of this press conference is to continue to reveal the truth in the conspiracy to assassinate Malcolm X. One of Malcolm's most profound quotes was, I am for truth no matter who tells it. I am for justice no matter who it's for or who it's against. Well, today we hope to get a little closer to truth of what happened when Malcolm X was assassinated so we can get some small measure of justice, Ilyasa, for you and your sisters. What do we know? What do Attorney Hamlin and Attorney Sheerness know that is not foreign to you all is that the FBI had many informants in the Audubon ballroom on that tragic day. We know that they withheld their information and did not let anybody know, send a directive, that nobody is to reveal our presence in the Audubon ballroom where Malcolm X was assassinated. We know that Eugene Roberts, who was an NYPD officer and working in the Special Division Bossy, and we know that he was told he could not in any way give any information during the criminal trials of those who were convicted for killing Malcolm X, but he subsequently, much later in life before he died, did give interviews where he revealed that he was in the Audubon ballroom, showed that he was a member of NYPD, showed that he had been put on special assignment for Bossy, and said that I know I was not the only informant in the room. He said that they kept us isolated. We didn't even know who the other informants were when we were trying to gather information and trying to be accepted in to the circles of trust. He also said that he believed he witnessed a dry run of Malcolm X's assassination a week prior, a close in time, where you had the individual say the same words that history has revealed over and over again, with a person yelling out right before Malcolm was shot. Nigga, get your hands out of my pockets. He said that a week before, the same exact thing happened. And it was his belief that that was a dry run. Also, from the Netflix documentary, uh, Who Killed Malcolm X, 
Arthur Fulton, an FBI agent, confessed that he was in charge of nine FBI informants who were in the Audubon Ballroom on that fateful day when Malcolm X was assassinated. We know through multiple accounts that Raymond Wood also working for NYPD and Bossy was in the Audubon Ballroom. We know that Jagger Hoover sent a directive in the release FBI files that to New York City do something about Malcolm X. We know that it was later revealed that John X. Ali Simmons, who was not present at the assassination, but was the National Secretary for the Nation of Islam, and the FBI withheld that John X. Ali was an informant for the FBI. And so, Today, as we continue to be able to establish the legal requirements to finally get some measure of justice for Malcolm X's family, to overcome the statute of limitations, we put forth the exception of fraudulent concealment. And in fraudulent concealment, we must show that the defendants conceal the existence of a cause of action. We must show that the plaintiffs remain ignorant of the cause of action until after the statute of limitations had expired, and that the plaintiff's ignorance was not due to lack of diligence. Nobody can say that Malcolm X's family has never ever accepted what the government tried to tell them. They've always sought the truth. This is a case, State of New York versus Hendrickson's Brothers Incorporated, 840. F sub second 1065 1988 case in the Second Circuit. Furthermore, before Attorney Hamlin addresses you and we introduce you to a witness who has never before spoken and why his information that he's going to share with you all is so explosive and astonishing. A claim for fraudulent concealment also requires the plaintiff to show a material misrepresentation of existing fact. Well, we know that after the Manhattan District Attorney was able to show that they withheld exculpatory evidence that they made with knowledge of falsity. And the last element that is really clear for all of us is an intent to induce reliance thereon, justifiable reliance upon the misrepresentation. Why is that so important? They had to make sure that the people who they said killed Malcolm X were convicted because that way it would have the family and everybody rely on their truth, their misrepresentation that we didn't have anything to do with conspiring to kill Malcolm X. These are the people who were convicted. We know that fallacy has been revealed to be 
an outright lie. We know that two of the individuals who they convicted of murder and Malcolm X were completely innocent. And so that brings us to here today about trying to tie together this conspiracy. You're going to hear from an individual who has not spoken in 58 years ever once. He's going to read from his affidavit his words. He was very suspiciously never called to the trial, never asked to give a deposition or a statement. He was a member of Malcolm's organization, Organization for African American Unity. He's going to speak for the first time today, even though for many years they did have great fear. They killed Malcolm. If they killed Malcolm, how could they feel that they wouldn't be killed or persecuted? But thankfully, uh, he has come forward to help Malcolm's daughters get justice and to tell his truth. And we have visual evidence, objective evidence that corroborates in many ways what information he is revealing today. It is very important that we understand that it's not just what he's saying, but when you look at it in the context of the photographs that were taken back in 1964, that we look at the stop video that attorney Desiree Austin and attorney Nabiha Shear were able to find after combing through thousands of photographs and thousands of video back from 1964. That was 1965, I apologize. And that's critical because it adds up. It adds up. You hear what he's saying and you see the objective video. And he tells you what he heard the police saying that night. That's the only thing we don't have. We have the pictures, we have the video, but we have no sound. But we have a eyewitness, and more importantly, we have a ear witness who heard what the NYPD officers were saying on the scene. Before he addresses you, my co-counsel who is a great attorney, a great Omega man, and has been with the family for years and helping them fight for truth and justice. I'm honored, so very honored, to work with him. Attorney Ray Hanley. Thank you, Brother Crump. Um, I'm sure everyone is here. You want to get to the, the reason why we're here today. Um, what I can tell you is sometime back in March, uh, I was contacted by a young lady um, who indicated that she had some information. She happens to be here uh, today. And she had some information that might be helpful to our pursuit in, in this uh, fight for justice. And uh, I had the good fortune of meeting Mustafa Hassan on Good Friday of all days in my office in Newark. And what he shared with me in the hour or so, two hours that, that we were talking, it became, in my estimation, so glaringly important that we needed to share it with the world. Um, yes, it's been 58 years, um, but he felt that now was the time to share the information that he had. And he was able to corroborate what he was saying 
by, by virtue of the historical photographs that exist and pre-exist at our meeting. So in, in, in a very sort of little known legal phrase that, that lay people aren't familiar with, the fact that he was present, he's, lo he's there, members of law enforcement should have investigated and should have spoken to him. They did not. That is the epitome of deliberate indifference. Hmm. Because at that point, Mr. Hassan had information clearly that was contrary to what the theory was behind what happened to Malcolm X. And, and I think once you hear this information, we are so grateful that we had the opportunity to meet with him that Mr. Hassan will share with, uh, with the world this information that he has. And it's supported, as I said, by documents, by photographs, by videos. And we hope that that will shed some light in further pursuit of the family as we tirelessly try and, and obtain justice for them. Thank, thank you very much, Attorney Hanlon. Uh, and interesting to note, when Mr. Mustafa Hassan first met with Attorney Hanlon and I, we didn't know about the existence of a video. But when you see this video, it corroborates everything that he is saying. And so it is important that we understand this fraudulent concealment and that the government actually instructed the ent entities that were in that room, you cannot reveal your presence in that room. They did that for a reason. We think it was as Attorney Helen and I just said to try to misinform the public about their involvement in the conspiracy to assassinate Malcolm X. Uh, we are so grateful that Mr. Mustafa Hassan is talking. Some of the witnesses have since died, and that has always been a grave concern to Ilyasa and her sisters, that the truth will be buried with the individuals that was in this very ballroom in 1965. But thanks to the Most High, he is still here with us, and you will hear from him and hear that he is very keenly aware. And there are others who are still with us who we hope will have the courage to come forward. As he goes through his affidavit with you all, we're going to have the photographs and illustrate for you all exactly what he's referring to, and he may even do it himself. So without further ado, Mr. Mustafa Hassan, the witness who was right there beside Malcolm in the last moments of his life. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will read to you the affidavits of myself, Mustafa Hassan, given in the state of New York, County of Kings, and it reads as follows. I, Mustafa Hassan, previously known as Richard Melwin Jones, being duly sworn, hereby depose and say, number one, I have personal knowledge of the facts stated in this affidavit and certify that the following statements are true. Number two, I am executing this affidavit freely and voluntarily. Number three, I'm over 18 years of age. My date of birth is... Don't give you that address. Okay. Your address. <laughs> and don't okay. give your address. All right. And number four, I am fully competent to make this affidavit and have personal knowledge of the facts stated in this affidavit. And number five, I was a member of the Organization of Afro American Unity, acronym OAAU, founded in 1964 by El Haj Malik El Shabazz also known as Malcolm X. Number six, on or about 
February 21st, 1965, I was present in the Audubon Ballroom at 3940 Broadway at West 165th Street in Manhattan, New York. I assisted with a security detail when Malcolm X delivered his speech. I was initially assigned to be in one of the aisles of the Audubon. Subsequently, one of the lieutenants higher in the OAAU chain of command structure instructed me to move towards the entrance to the uh, ballroom. <clears throat> Number eight. As Malcolm X began his speech, a disturbance occurred when someone yelled, Nigga, get your hand out of my pocket. Immediately thereafter, Malcolm X stepped forward and asked everyone to stay calm to de-escalate the uh, situation. Now, all of a sudden, number nine, there was a loud explosion that immediately caused further disruption, capturing everyone's attention. Now, a series of gunshots, number 10, then rang out from another direction, and I immediately ran from my post in the entrance and witnessed Malcolm X being shot. Number 11, I immediately started to make my way from the back of the Audubon, where I had been posted, and towards the stage where Malcolm X was located. However, the scene became chaotic as people frantically ran around seeking exits to cover and protect themselves. Number 12, I saw a man running down the aisle towards the exit where I had been posted with a gun in his hand. I made the decision to attempt to stop this person because he had a gun in his hand and was heading directly towards me. Number 13, I managed to knock this person down and I continued towards the stage where Malcolm X was lying on his back surrounded by his followers. I know now that the identity of the man with the gun is Talmadge X. Hayer, also known as Thomas Hagen. When I arrived at the stage, I saw that Malcolm X was in grave condition, seemingly close to death, and as a result, my extreme distress and anger, I turned attention back to the man who I had seen running away, knowing that he had a part of responsibility for what I had just witnessed. Number 16. I would later see the same man outside as he was, was being beaten by Malcolm's followers, while a group of policemen who suddenly showed up on the scene asked if he was with us, while at the same time holding back Malcolm's followers from beating him. Can you repeat that? Yes. I would later see the same man outside as he was being beaten by Malcolm's followers while a group of policemen who suddenly showed up on the scene asking, is he with us? While at the same time holding back Malcolm's followers from beating him. From my vantage point, this was an attempt by the police to assist in him getting away. Rather than allow the man to get away, I reached out and grabbed the man by his collar to prevent him from escaping. As evidence in the attached photograph that you'll see, you'll see me grabbing Talmadge Hare while a police officer tried to hold, tried to come between us in Exhibit A. Number 17, when he was in police custody, then I went back inside the Audubon and observed on stage Sister Betty Shabazz, Malcolm X, wife, Sister Yuri Kochiyama, a co-member of the OAAU, and others surrounding Malcolm's prone body. There are photographs of myself and other individuals trying to assist, assist Malcolm in Exhibit B. Number 18, I later observed Malcolm X being removed from the Audubon as he was placed on a stretcher and then on a gurney to be taken to the hospital. I can be seen escorting Malcolm to the hospital outside of the Audubon as I help clear the way on the street to get him to the hospital as quickly as possible. Number 20, 
I later discovered one of the men assisting Malcolm was Eugene Roberts, an undercover agent with the Bureau of Special Services and Investigation in the New York City Police Department, NYPD, and Raymond A. Woods, another undercover agent with BOSSI, B-O-S-S-I, in the New York Police Department, was also present at the assassination. 21. I know Eugene Roberts has stated he believed he witnessed a dry run of Malcolm X's assassination on February 15th in 1965. I can attest that there were previous attempts on Malcolm X's life, and I believe I witnessed one earlier. After police and medical officials removed Malcolm's body from the Audubon, Sister Kochiyama stated that Ray Woods is said to have been seen running out of the Audubon and was one of the two people picked up by the police. I agree with Yuri Kochiyama. Number 23, there were no uniformed policemen in or around the Audubon the day Malcolm X was murdered compared to previous speeches and events where Malcolm was present. Number 24, to this day, despite my presence inside and outside of the Audubon on the day of the assassination, law enforcement never attempted to interview or attain a statement from me regarding what I had seen, heard, and actually did on that day. Number 25, after Malcolm's assassination, I was concerned that the lack of law enforcement's focus on myself could change to interest in myself. I became so disillusioned by what I had seen and experienced that I had made arrangements to and did leave the country for a number of months as I sought a new residence for myself and my family. This was done out of concern for my and my family's safety and where I believe the United States as a society was headed. Number 26, I am aware that NYPD officials claim that Malcolm X exaggerated assassination attempts on his life. They believe Malcolm X complaints and attempts on, of contempt, attempts on his life were a publicity stunt. After he contacted NYPD in July of 64, after he was approached in his car by two men when he arrived home that evening. I believe that Malcolm X's claims were valid because I personally witnessed one such attempt earlier in 1964. On the penalty of perjury, I hereby declare and affirm that the above mentioned statement is true and correct to the best of my knowledge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hassan. Before you take your seat, uh, and before we show the video and go to Q&A, could you point out on this photograph where you're at, sir? And we have a better photograph for you that we will share with you electronically, but we wanted you all to be able to have him point himself out where he's at grabbing on Talmadge Harris' collar and how the police are trying to separate him from that. Now, a picture does tell a thousand words, but when you put it in, a picture does tell a thousand words, but when you put it in context with what he heard the police saying, is he with us? It goes back to what Eugene Roberts said. We didn't know who the informants were. I don't think the NYPD knew who was in that ballroom and for what reasons. They knew that they had police officers undercover in that ballroom. And that is something that he can put context to the photographs and the video you're about to see. Now, 
on this photograph here. Can you point out, Mr. Hassan, where you're at in this photograph with Malcolm? Hold, hold it up a little. You can see it. Okay. And now if you could step with me over you here, Miss. should Ms. also point out my mother. Okay. And, and can Eliasa say, can you point out her mother in that photograph? Yes. And then finally, Mr. Hassan, can you point out where you're at in this photograph? Okay. And, and can you point out and tell who is on the stretcher? Thank you. And, and I know uh, we'll let you sit down for a minute and, and then we'll have you stand back up. Now, if we could turn your attention, Attorney Shear, are we ready to show the video? And if you all turn your attention and remember, let me get up. I, I, I keep telling me to stand in front of the microphones. Remember, when he told us what he heard and we saw the pictures, we had no idea that there was video in existence from 1965 until Attorney Shearer and Attorney Desiree Austin went looking for every photograph they could find and then subsequently found that there was some stock video that we're also going to share with you electronically. And we have affidavits of what just was read to you that we'll give you all here uh, if it's present with us, but also we will send that to you electronically if you go to press at bencrump.com. We want to make sure everybody has all this important evidence because as Ilyasa and her family have said all along, they don't want the truth to be buried. Thank you so much, Mr. Hassan. If we can turn your attention to the video. Ilyasa, you want to walk over here? Once all the way through, and then we're going to have Mr. Hassan give color to the video with the narration of what was happening, what he heard them say. No, this is stock video taken outside of the Audubon Ballroom in 1965, right after Malcolm X had been murdered. In fact, they got video from inside the ballroom, too. This is the stock video from news services and wires 
that are on the uh, internet that Mr. Hassan is present. And Mr. Hassan is present in the videos. And as is Talmadge. As is Talmadge, as is Malcolm X, and as is Ben Sebastian. The video of that scene right there. Yes. And as is Mr. Hassan grabbing the collar. Yes. Right. And then in the video you see police pulling him back. But I will let him uh, narrate for him. Uh, any other questions before we begin the video? Talmadge's full name? Talmadge Air. Hair. Hair. H A Y E R. And he's one of the, uh, the convicted murderer of Malcolm X. Any more questions before we begin the video? How long is yeah, it? sure. A minute and a half? If that, sure. You yes, sir. Yeah, we, if you press it, Ben Crump, we will email links out. Thank you. Ben Okay. Uh, any other questions? If, if not, attorney Nabiha Shir. Okay, so that's the stock video. Uh, any questions for Mr. Hassan? Attorney Crump, the man with the beard, can we confirm that that's you, Dean Roberts? We understand that to be him. No shots of him giving Malcolm artificial uh, respiration. Not that we have on this video. Or Yuri Kochiyama being there on the stage. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That was that was bad. His wife. Okay. Who was a nurse at the time. A registered nurse giving him um, rece resuscitative. Yeah. I had a question, but I would like to submit it. Okay, well, first we want to have Mr. <coughs> Hassan. Let's replay the video. Uh, and if you could, I don't matter how many times you got to replay it, if you could show where you're present at in the video. Play the video. Okay, yeah. We'll have it positive. Okay. Oh, right. Pause. And, and, and Attorney Hammer makes a good point. These are only a portion of things. It's not everything that happened. This is the only thing that the videos capture. But when we pause it, Mr. Asai, can you show? Where you at? And Mr. Hassan, can you tell members of the media how old were you at that time? I had a birthday on January 8th, so I made me 26 years old. 26 years old at the time. Okay. All right. Can you continue on, Attorney Shim? Right there. Uh, continue on because I think at the 35th second, that's when we closed. That was walking to the hospital. That was walking to the hospital. Right here. Okay. With that 35 second. Okay. So can you tell, and I know it's, they can see it better when it's, they get the actual video, but where's your hand at in this video, Mr. Son? Okay, you can play it 
Yeah. Yeah. Can you can go back a little? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Go a little bit further. Right there. Yeah. Right there. And you you were grabbing onto his collar. Yes. And in a firm grip at that point. Okay. And at some point, I know they can't hear you good. I want you to explain how you believe they were trying to get you away from him. Ah, uh, you can continue the video. And do, do they make, at some point, do they pull your collar back? Yes, at one point, uh, police knew that he was not going to go anywhere, so they executed the arrest. And that's when the crowd, mountains followed us, step back, I also step back, and the police just followed Okay, continue. <coughs> the link that'll be much clearer than this is here. And it's on Venmo as well. Setting up the spelling of Mr. Hassan's name is Mustafa. M is in Mary. U S T is in Tom. A F A. Mustafa Hassan. H A S S A N. And. Uh, Anything else, Ray? We want us to go ahead. Okay, where the affidavit set? Okay. So we, you and uh, Attorney Solomon, y'all want to just hand out the affidavits. So they, we're going to give you affidavits as you ask your questions, so you can have it, and we're going to send it to you electronically. Thank you. Yeah. I, I Initially, when I saw the uh, melee in front of the Audubon, and I saw that the victim was the same man that I had stopped earlier, I got as close to this melee action as I could to get a good look at him and to see, make sure that he did not get away. Two policemen who came over closest to me, one of them made that statement. There were other policemen holding back the crowd, but the two closest to me, one of them made that statement. But my focus was not on them until I realized that they were blocking me. I don't know if you know anything about basketball, but you can block a person 
And uh, this is what was done to keep me from grabbing him after they made that statement. But after I held on to him, which is obvious in the pictures, uh, they realized that he was not going to get away and they had to arrest him. And that's when I let him go. Why do you think they were referring to town and what did you think is the implication of that statement? Words uh, spoken with emphasis and with dimension. The manner in which the policeman made this statement, whichever one of them it was, the uh, dimension of his speech left no doubt in my mind that he was talking about Helmich, Haya. What is the implication of that? If you are correct, then you're going to They were addressing it to each other as they approached him. And what did you make of the implication of saying, is he one of us? What did I make of that? Yes. At the time, I didn't focus on that. My only focus at the time was the fact that he was caught and he was arrested. And I, looking back decades, scores of years later, uh, I can add more emphasis to uh, my understanding what they were doing. <laughs> this is the Azan for prayer. <laughs> Kindly hold your questions until the Azan has finished. I think I covered that. No, no, I, I, I keep saying okay. you heard it all you say, mm -hmm. police were involved. Do you think the police were involved? You didn't think much about it at the time, but now you're here talking to us. What is the implication of what you heard now? Now looking, oh yes, uh, that absolutely uh, the police had people uh, in the Audubon who at that point were trying to get out of the Audubon and they couldn't tell who was who because there's 400 people there rushing out. And that question, to me, looking back, is they're making a decision as to whether he was one of their undercovers or not. And obviously they made a decision initially when there was doubt in their mind to uh, allow him to escape. They made, a, they made a choice, made a decision in favor of him. But at the point that we, they could not uh, permit him to escape, because I held him, uh, they decided to arrest him. Okay, let me say, I'm 84 years old, so you're going to have to speak as if you're speaking to an 84-year-old person who's 20 feet away from you. Talk louder. Just speak up. Let me reiterate from the affidavits. He is a person leaving the Audubon as fast as he could run in a, a loping kind of a run, which I later found out was, of course, one of the security people that <coughs> shot him in the leg. 
but he is a person who was running out with a pistol in his hand, waving the pistol in the air, getting people out of his way. And I was the primary person in his way because I had left uh, the position where I'd been reposted and was headed towards Malcolm. And I decided I needed to take him down at any risk. And I applied some of my military skills and was able to take him down and then continue up towards Malcolm. I didn't hold him because he was not the focus of my urgency. Running towards Malcolm was the focus of my urgency. So I knocked him down and ran up to the stage where Malcolm was lying on his back. But do you think he was working with the NYPD? No, no doubt in my mind. The NYPD, CIA, FBI, you know, but he was definitely working for some government establishment. And, and let, let's be clear. Let's be clear about this. We continue to say you have to put this in context. Not even the informants themselves were aware of who all was involved. That's why we are putting forth in our legal action that the government was involved in the conspiracy to kill Malcolm X. They did not allow anybody to reveal their presence or what they were doing in the Audubon Ballroom. Eugene Roberts said he, they had a dry run in his estimation of what was going on. He saw that in hindsight, but he didn't even know what was going on, and he is a confirmed informant. Ray Wood also confirmed his presence in that ballroom, and he was an NYPD officer. So what we're saying is this conspiracy goes up to the top. Jagger Hoover said to the New York Police Department, sent word down in the FBI files, do something about Malcolm X. And so we're putting it all in context, the fact when police first run up to the person who has just shot Malcolm X, are they trying to stop him? No. What they're saying is he with us because they don't know if their person was assigned to shoot Malcolm or not. Because as Eugene said, Roberts. Eugene Roberts said, they kept us isolated. And he believed that was done intentionally as well. And Mr. Crump, I just wanted to say, you believe that the hater was not a member of the Nation of Islam? I, I, I will say this, and I want to be clear. I don't want to be taken out of context. I don't know what Hare or anybody else was doing. But what we have laid out is that informants were in there. Whether he was an informant or not, we would never know. They didn't, haven't revealed who the informants are till this day. Uh, Arthur Fulton, hold on. Arthur Fulton said there were nine informants in the Audubon Ballroom. Were some of the informants told to assassinate Malcolm X? Or were those informants told to keep people back? Were they told to get rid of his security detail so it could be easier to commit the mission? We can't tell you verbatim what they did because for 58 years, the American government and law enforcement have colluded to make sure that Elias and her family never know the truth. So we're having to, under all of the innuendo, all of the second guessing, try to put together a 58-year-old puzzle to give them the truth. So take what Mr. Hassan said as what it is. The police came saying, is the shooter of Malcolm X with us? Did you file your suit yet? Uh, the no, we filed a notice of claim. We have to wait a certain time before we can file. Why? Because that's what the law says. What's the timeline when you have to file? Uh, 90 days. When, no, it's a little later. The federal agencies have six Take the mic, take the mic. The federal agencies have six months to make a determination before we can file a lawsuit. And for the uh, New York agencies, we have one year and 90 days within the time that we put them on notice to file a lawsuit. Thank you. Mr. Hassan, uh, uh, I have a question for you. Yes. You are so clearly present in all of these videos. Yes. Did anyone approach you when it came time for the trials? For deposing you, did the police come to you to ask you what you have seen? And do you know other people like yourself who were there? Uh, they 
they at no time ever approached me before, during, or after the trial. And to answer what, whether there were other people there at the time, yes, there were. I have a first cousin, uh, the son of my mother's sister, uh, who was there that day. He would have been the youngest adult. He and his wife were there also. He would, the two of them would, would have been the youngest adults there. Uh, Malcolm X's children would be naturally children, they were kids, but uh, my first cousin and his wife were the two youngest adults there. Uh, he has passed, he died. Uh, she, I saw, I've seen her within the last four or five years when a street was dedicated in Harlem to Alambe Brat. I met her at that uh, occasion and uh, she looked well and happy. Unfortunately, my cousin died of a radiation cancer. Um. Did you ever approach the police or the FBI, the authorities, to share what you had seen? No, no, and no. No. Because? <laughs> because? They had just killed Malcolm. Malcolm. <laughs> Terrorism, uh, trauma. Because in my, my belief, they, they were the Malcolm. perpetrators. Malcolm. And they knew more than I did consequence of being the perpetrators of the uh, event. Why would I go to them? Go to them? And uh, for whatever reason they called me, as the attorney stated, the reason that they failed to call me would have been that my testimony uh, would have uh, changed the outcome of the trial. It would have pointed a finger of guilt at the establishment, NYPD, or, as you said, it could be FBI, CIA, any of the government uh, organizations, because that would have been the uh, consequence of my testimony. And that may be the reason they never called me. And, of course, my reason for never approaching them is because I knew that uh, they were involved on some level or levels. Now I'm listening. This isn't for you. I think this is for the attorneys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 This, this, for anyone. Right. Yeah. I mean, he has made a variety of public statements, but has he ever said that he, has he ever said that? Not that we're aware of. No. And and this isn't this isn't about Talmadge Hare. This is about an awareness based on what's been confirmed by Mr. Hassan that members of law enforcement had to have been aware of other people that were working along with them to potentially have involvement in the assassination of Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Otherwise, why say is he with us? That's the whole point. He's not saying he was or he wasn't. But clearly, there was an awareness on their part that there were people who were with them that weren't police officers. And then, correct. Okay. Well, that the assassination was happening and that this was some grand, yeah, plot to deal with the quote-unquote Malcolm X problem. And, and as you put it in full context, as Ilyasa and I were just whispering to one another, put it in full context, and then they go out and let two innocent men spend 20 years in prison when they knew from day one that they were not involved. You have to put it all in context. Just read your statement. Okay. I'll answer that one, but you go ahead. She's just going to make a statement, and we'll answer the other part of your question. We simply want the truth to be known, the history books to reflect the organization, the, the orchestra. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. The orchestration of the assassination of our father, and we want justice to be served. 
because I think what history is, has recorded is inaccurate. So we want the truth to be known. We want the history books to reflect that truth. And we would like justice to be served. Amen. Um, and as it relates to the Nation of Islam or any individuals, what we think is clear is that the federal government had infiltrated all of the organizations. So individuals who might we might suspect was working for the Nation of Islam, we don't really know if they were working for the federal government or not. Because as Eugene, what's his last name? Roberts. There's so many names. And John Ali. And John Ali. They kept them isolated for a reason. And if you know anything about, I guess, uh, government espionage and so forth, and obviously Jagger Hoover had made a determination that Malcolm X was one of the top enemies in America, that you use that espionage and whatever is at your disposal to gain information and to plot, to take down what you believe is a threat. And clearly, J. Edgar Hoover had determined Malcolm X, this black messiah, a threat to the United States. Any other? Yes, sir. It, it, it would be really good if uh, the FBI let us have all the information that they have, but obviously they haven't done it in 58 years, so we're not very optimistic that they're going to do that now. What we will hope is that the New York government officials today, the current people who are in power, um, the mayor and the city council, will try to do justice by Ilyasa and her sisters, that the Justice Department, who have access to all information, will finally try to give some measure of justice to Malcolm X's family after these many decades of the psychological trauma, pain, and anguish that they've had to experience over the assassination of their father. It is, and, and it also reminds us of the pain and suffering that her mother, Betty Shabazz, had to endure all these years believing that they were involved, but still not being able to get to the truth. Venmo. Venmo. It's, we're going to get it to you. We're going to get the, you can. Great, great research great, by the attorney. Great, great young minds, <laughs> great brilliant minds saying, Attorney Crump, maybe you should look at this. This is the video right after they killed Malcolm. And it's stock video that's out there on the internet. And it, and it showed us, it showed us Mr. Hassan and many of the video images when he's on the stage there with Malcolm and Betty Shabazz, when he's there grabbing him at the collar and you see the police come and separate him. And you also see him when they finally get Malcolm on the stretcher walking out. Um, so that's what that video was. And it was, we only saw it two days ago but it showed him throughout the video, just as many of the photographs show him in the video. And uh, we're grateful that he came forward after seeing Eliasa and the family fighting to try to get historic justice that had long been denied to them to say, I'm going to tell them what I know. Uh, are there any other questions? Uniformed police officers showed up 
after this man had been beaten for a while and uh, began to intervene. And initially, uh, they made that statement when they saw him that I've already testified to. And uh, it appeared to me, from my vantage point, that after they made a determination, they decided to let him go because they moved the crowd back and off of him, and he was making a lurge, a lunge to escape, at which time I reached around the cop who was block, blocking me and made sure that he didn't escape, grabbed his collar, and I held on to it until they decided we have to make an arrest. He's been held at the scene of the crime, trying to escape. We have no choice but to arrest him, but they were prepared to let him go. And that's my perspective, looking back on the film and also recollection. We will keep you informed. Attorney Demario Solomon Simmons, uh, another great lawyer and uh, a member of Omegas here, he wanted to make just a brief statement because we're fighting for the truth to come out on so many fronts. And he is the attorney uh, with the survivors of the Tulsa race massacre. And so, Attorney Solomon Simmons, if you make a brief statement. Sure. I'm Attorney Demario Solomon Simmons. I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And as Ben stated, I represent the last three known living survivors of the Tulsa race massacre. And that's why it was so important for me to be here today to stand with uh, Malcolm X's uh, family and his amazing attorneys, including my good friend and mentor, Ben Crump, because these are type of historical wrongs and murders and destructions of black communities and black leaders must be, it must be some accountability. This family, just like my clients, have lived with trauma for 102 years. They lived with trauma for almost 60 years. And it's something that they deal with each and every day. And what it says is if you cannot bring the perpetrators of the murders of people like Malcolm X, who was a worldwide figure, or if you cannot bring the perpetrators of the Tulsa Race Massacre, which is the largest race massacre in the history of this country, if there is no accountability, that means no black person is safe, period. It means that it's still 1857, and a black man has no rights that a white man is bound to respect. You have the video, you have the pictures, we have the same things in Tulsa, and you have a witness here telling you what you've heard. So I'm just proud to stand here with this family and with these amazing attorneys as they fight to get justice. I stand with them. Our organization, Justice for Greenwood, stands and fights with them and calling upon President Joe Biden, the Biden administration, our dear sister Christian Clark and the Department of Justice to do the right thing by this family. Give them the information that they need. Give them truth. They're just asking for truth. That's all they're asking for. And the same things we're asking for with the Tulsa Race Massacre. So I stand here on behalf of my, my community and stand with this family. Thank you very much, Attorney Solomon Simmons. Mr. President, one of the points you said earlier in your remarks, but what do you mean before you file your suit? What do you mean in place before your suit can go forward? I think there's time at this point. Time. We need time. The six months has to run. So you have a hearing any day. What do you mean? No, 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 no. Maybe, maybe you misunderstand it. We have to wait six months after we gave our notice of claim, which we did about three months ago. So I oh. Oh, we think we got it. We think we have enough. So how can we have to file a suit? <laughs> so, so, listen, right. if you can't do anything for six months. <laughs> Nothing. By law. <laughs> right. By law. Yes. Uh, the law doesn't allow right. you. That's it. That's it. That's it. Uh -huh. All right. Hey, who do you work for, man? New York One. New York One. Okay. <laughs> Got it. All right. Any other questions? And if not, we will keep you all updated. We thank. Just what is it, sir? What what is it that you think that the act in this room where all this happened? I was waiting for the question. What brings me back? Uh, the initial spark seeing on YouTube that the family was seeking financial redress. And I knew absolutely that they were entitled to it. Now, uh, that was my initial inspiration to do it. And in, in the process of analyzing that, uh, I reflected, reflected back on the contribution of their father to the African-American nation. In the previous year, last year of his life, he spent a lot of time in Africa 
planting seeds for the eventual recognition of the consanguinity of Africans and African Americans. This was done. He was accepted by scores of nations as a man among mankind, an outstanding human being, and a brave warrior for his people. And they gave him the kind of welcome that after he was assassinated, I decided I'm leaving, going to Africa, not back to Africa, forward to Africa, where I could raise my family in a society that was one based on honorable respect for its own traditions and its own constitution, and that is justice for all, okay? So I left the country looking for a place and was amazed at the level of warmth that the African people showed me. I got as far as Cairo, and in Cairo, you've got to actually go there to know what it's like to be among very friendly, warm-hearted, loving, uh, peace-loving people. And that's where I decided I would stay with my family. And then I met a student from uh, South <coughs> Africa, not the South Africa, but from Bachano Land. I think they changed the name after liberation. And uh, that inspired me to go to Tanzania. And uh, so before I was able to make that move, uh, circumstances in my personal life uh, required that I return home and make the trip to Africa at another time, which I did. But coming forward now, uh, I look at the legacy that Malcolm has left, the undone work that he started, and the burden of it on myself personally as a member of OAAU, on us as a people, as the beneficiaries of what the OAAU was set up to do, and that was to elevate us uh, to the next level in our struggle for freedom, justice, and uh, independence for ourselves. And we were grateful for him because he earned for us the respect that makes that possible. All the nations of the world now are rotating towards a new center uh, in seeking justice, in seeking equality, and, and fairness in business, in commerce, in trade, and in human relations. America is now losing the control and hold that she has had, not only on her ex-slaves, but on the rest of the world. When we look beyond the shores, we see that what was done to us for 400 years has been done to other people for just as long. And so that's coming to an end. Africa is awakened now. Beyond just running a flag up the pole, now they're saying we are not going to be subservient to the West. And that's the primary or the most important motivation for me to come forward and help this family. Thank, thank you, Mr. Sai. And I, I'm going to go back to your question. But he, like so many other members of the OAAU, were true students of Malcolm X and the philosophy of self-determination and that we as black people have a right to self-determination by any means necessary. And so I, I'm grateful to these uh, elderly statesmen for our people. And, and I guess the last thing, Mr. Hassan, he wanted to know, you being back in this room, how does it make you feel after all these years? And that'll be the question we end on. Okay. Uh, Cause you a little bit of history. Our struggles, serious struggles for equality in America go back to the 40s and 50s and it reached its epogee in the 60s. Uh, up until that time, Journalism was what it was created to be and meant to be from our Constitution, a fourth estate, all right? That has changed. Now, uh, we don't know what to believe anymore. Those of us who are involved in our struggle can recognize when journalists are lying to us. The whole country, everybody in the world is recognizing that these days. But now that we have uh, the ability to actually 
create in the internet another thought, more reality, more truth, then journalists, in order to survive, have to become more uh, responsible to the people, more responsible to their estate in, our, in, in how this country was set up to be. They have a role to play. And that role is to do exactly what these attorneys have done, search for the truth. And when you get it, don't be afraid to publicize it. It Amen. may cost you imprisonment, loss of whatever, but that is the only thing that can save the country. My concern is not so much to save the country, but that you do what's necessary to help us elevate ourselves by helping get our truth out so that we can pick up a newspaper and find out that, yeah, journalists are beginning to recognize their true role, and that is to bring, uh, speak truth to power. That's, that's one of the reasons. And Thanks. This is an occasion to do that, to ask you to help do that. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you.